this within six months sorry yes however within six months we received notification whereby certain assessments were considered for faceless assessment so they tried to implement it in a phased manner whereby limited scrutiny or the scrutiny is where only specified issues to be were to be verified were considered over there going ahead in 2019 the powers under the old 143 3a were exercised and the notification in sex in number 61 and 62 were introduced into the act the said notification laid out a complete procedure as to how a faceless assessment is to be carried out however it limited itself to limited scrutinies and did, and regular assessments under section 143 3 there was no consideration of of a best judgment assessment or a reassessment under section 147 later on sorry over that scheme if just to take a quantifical or stat, uh, statistics about 60000 notices were issued and again in number of cases we observed that the communications were through email though the assessee appeared physically to the assessing officer's office further going in august 2020 the department amended the earlier notification number 61 wide a notification in six, number 60 by changing the name of the scheme from national e assessment scheme to faceless assessment scheme the whole motive of a faceless assessment was to remove the interface between the assc and the department for one and secondly to establish and introduce functional specialization into the assessment procedures what did they mean by functional specialization was a assessing officer many times we challenged ki wo property ka valuation bhi khud hi nikal dete the he would consider the ready reckoner rate and determine the value of your property without even referring the matter to the department and valuation officer number of cases like the assessing officer many at times was helped by the assessee himself or the authorized representative rather i would say the chartered accountant used to explain the assessee as to how the act is to be read how the accounting standards are followed and how the income is computed according to the accounting standards in order to improvise and increase the efficiency of the department now these functions have been specialized and four units have been separately formed the four units are the assessment unit the verification unit the technical unit and the review unit we will get into this deeper later in our seminar subsequently the ordinance of 2020 famously known as tola the taxation of other laws and relief act 2020 introduced section 144 b whereby it was stated that the notification of 60 of will be in effective from 1st of april 21 and section 144 b shall be introduced accordingly even section 143 3a 3b 3c 3d also became in effective from 31st march of 21 and from 1st april 21 144 b was brought into the act immediately within one year of its introduction the section has been completely revamped the section consisted of section number 1 to section 10 as per the finance act 21 however finance act 22 revamped the section and section 9 and 10 have been omitted completely obviously these have been done in order to save the skin of the department and we'll come to know later as we move ahead before we proceed let's go through the types of assessments that are carried out under the income tax act and what has been made faceless till date usually we have a intimation called or we call intimation under section 1431 which is not an order but a summary assessment it has been faceless since it has been introduced and there was no special procedure to be introduced for it what has been made faceless by the faceless assessment is the regular assessment under section 1433 the best judgment assessment under section 144 and now through the amendment even the reassessment under section 147 has been covered within the ambit of faceless assessments the surge assessments under section 153a 153c 
those section does not exist as of today according to the cbdt notification the said assessment proceedings are yet out of the ambit of faceless assessments then we have rectification under section 154 which yet falls within the scope of the jurisdictional assessing officer in a 154 application we try to rectify a mistake apparent from record and now we have experienced the faceless assessment for the very first time this year number of faceless assessment orders have been received till date and 154 applications filed before the assessing officer major reason being that the assessee assessee has filed the response or a submission in detail before the officer but the officer has not considered it at all and passed a order assessee has tried to file a 154 application which as i have experienced till date have been rejected right away by the officer however the only remedy that remains to the assessee in such cases is to file an appeal before the cit appeals now then we have revision assessments section 263 talks about revision by the principal cit where he finds an order to be erroneous in so far as prejudicial to the interest of revenue therefore 263 is done only in case where the order is erroneous in the perspective of the revenue whereas 264 is alternative remedy to the assc where he may seek revision of an order in his favor the relevant sections of the act that play a pivotal role in assessment proceedings are the section 27a which defines assessing officer 120 and 124 that determines the jurisdiction of assessing officer 142.1 if we read this particular section it states that a notice under section 142.1 may be issued by an assessing officer however now the said notice is also being issued by the national faceless assessment center how is it done it's done by introducing a amendment in the section 142.1 if you notice there is a proviso to subsection 1 of section 142 which has provide which provides that even a prescribed authority can issue a notice under 142 one we will discuss the same later in our seminar subsequent then we have notice under section 1432 which we know is issued when assessee files a return of income section 130.1 talks about powers similar to that of the code of civil procedures which refer to the discovery production of evidence recording of statement etc 133 calling of information we are familiar with 133 subsection 6 where information is called from the bank and then we have assessment under 143 144 where the officer after considering the submission of the assc passes a order determining the income or loss and the tax payable or refund to the assc the budget 19 when it proposed the faceless assessment stated the intention as if we read only the point number 1 the existing system of scrutiny assessment in income tax department involves high level of personal interaction between taxpayer and the department which leads to certain undesirable practices on the part of tax officials see in my experience the income tax department would be the most honest tax department of the government and to bring such structures of a faceless assessment without a proper faced introduction of the same has been misplaced and led to lot of litigation in form of writ petitions moving ahead we may see the evolution of how electronic proceedings came to life till date In 2006, the TDS statement and return of income of companies was made mandatory to be e-filed. Somewhere in October 15, concept of email-based communication was introduced, whereby the assessee and department could communicate through the email addresses. In December 15, the department provided for service of notice through electronic communications. So this was a substantial step towards faceless proceedings. in february 16 and april 17 cbdt notified 
a secure transmission of electronic communication that is followed by ITBA. ITBA is an application of the department which facilitates communication between the department and the SEC prior to the face assessment scheme. As we discussed, Budget 18 introduced Section 143A, 3B, and 3C. In February 18, the CBD directed that except for search cases, the assessment proceedings shall be considered to e-proceedings. August 18, the CBD introduced for conduct of assessment proceedings with e-proceeding facility, where limited scrutinies were covered only. In e-assessment scheme, only regular assessments were covered. August 20, renamed the scheme to faceless assessment scheme. And in September 20, the ordinance introduced section 144B, where even assessment under 144 were covered. And now we stand at a position, well, through Finance Bill 2022, even reassessments under section 147 are covered by the new scheme. This is a pictorial depiction of how the faceless assessments have evolved. Then, I would draw the attention peculiarly to a circular number 19, 2019, dated 14 August 19, and urge you all to point out if a particular assessment order is having a DIN number or no, or a notice that gives jurisdiction to the assessing officer, like the notice under section 140 or the notice under section 143.2, which gives jurisdiction to the officer, to assessing officer to carry out your assessment should bear a DIN number. In case any of these orders or a notice does not bear a DIN number, you have a very valid ground for considering such order or notice to have never existed and be invalid. And this is within the powers of the notification issued by the CBDT itself. This is one good legal ground to consider. 360 degree profiling. We have heard a lot about how 360 degree profiling would be conducted. The department has all the information of the SSE in respect of what transaction is carrying out, what are his investments. Information even of fixed deposits where no TDS is made is with the department. Your purchase and sale of the shares and mutual funds and each and every transaction where a pan is submitted is reported on the 360 degree profile of taxpayer. It's basically a Janma Kundali of a SEC on the basis of pan number. It is advisable that the assessees consider 360 degree profiling very seriously and while filing the return of income, take care that they offer all the income as per their transactions without hiding anything. We had a very good experience with the same in the AIS data this year. There have been cases where I used to call my clients and state that, sir, you have entered into share transactions about 20 lakh rupees. To which they say, no, sir, there have been no transaction. It was a COVID period. I have to say, I have the complete data before me. I can name the shares, the quantity of which has been sold. And then they come to agree about it. So always take care as a chartered accountant to go through the AIS data before finalizing a return or even a submission in response to a notice to see what all has been on the record of department. It's better be preventive and take precaution than to find a cure in form of appeal later. Because even the penalty strictures have become very harassing to the SEC in as much as you may refer to section 271 AD. He states that if any face, if any wrong invoice or a wrong entry or a malefied entry has been made in the books of accounts, the penalty equal to the amount of particular entry will be levied on the SSC. Therefore, take 360 degree profiling very seriously, refer to AIS data as and when possible, so that a proper submission and disclosure is made before the department. So what are the features of the faceless assessment? Basically, uh, the selection of the cases is based on AI. They call it as 
a protocol on basis of which the cases are determined which has been done earlier as well we called it as cas routines which has been merged into faceless assessment as well in faceless assessment there is complete abolition of territorial jurisdiction uh, as i see in maharashtra maybe assist somewhere in uttar pradesh the verification of which through the verification unit maybe somewhere in kolkata and technical assistance may be in delhi we don't know however it's all spread across deeply as for the chartered accountant there is no traveling stay home stay safe and appear for the assessments as well as the faceless appeal as you've noticed that din as we discussed has played an important role avoidance of red tapism again the department has rather the government has been stressing a lot on red tapism i don't know what kind of cases they have come across to institute a complete faceless regime on that basis team based assessments in earlier the assessing officer was a single individual who carried out your assessment now there will be a team of three people who shall be carrying out the assessment again the issues arise as to how three people can carry out one assessment and how they come to a common conclusion on each one just referring through section 143 3a that was introduced by finance act 18 which empowered the department of the ministry to introduce the e assessment scheme 2019 the central government may make a scheme by notification in official gazette for purpose of making assessment of total income or loss of assess fee under section sub section 3 or section 144 so as to impart greater efficiency transparency and accountability by eliminating interface between the assessing officer and assessee so everywhere you go the very first point that they have targeted is the interface between the ao and the assessee secondly optimizing utilization of resources through economies of scale and functional specialization functional specialization they have introduced different units with specialized functions like the verification unit and the technical unit which shall assist the assessment unit in the course of assessment proceeding and team based assessment with dynamic jurisdiction as we discussed a team of officers shall be carrying shall be in assessment unit which shall carry out your assessment now in the faceless regime there is no assessing officer all you have is assessment unit which shall comprise of three people and dynamic jurisdiction refers to the jurisdiction of the assessment unit shall be pan indian as discussed the faceless e assessment scheme was introduced by notification number 61 and 62 which was modified by notification number 62 notification number 60 and 61 renamed the scheme and also introduced three changes they included assessment under section 144 under the scheme enable transition of pending cases under the scheme and provided time limit for corresponding responding to notice under 142 the question does arise the scheme has been introduced as a whole no doubt but how do the other sections that are also equally important for carrying out the assessment will function in tandem with the assessment proceeding why notification number 62 the department referred to number of sections which have been appearing on the screen primarily the definition of section 2 uh, assessing officer under section 27a reference to tpo under section 92ca jurisdiction of the officer pars under 131 power of survey inquiry under section 142 etc all of these sections were proposed to be amended in accordance with the e assessment scheme and accordingly the department also introduced various sections into the act for example reference to transfer pricing officer has been covered by section 92 ca a subsection 8 was introduced in order to make it faceless at a later date and to state by the present amendment of 2022 or the final the finance amendment 
transfer pricing assessments have also been made faceless. Even the reference to the RP has been made faceless. Section 120, 124, 127, 129, which refer to the jurisdiction of income tax authorities, for which Section 130 has been introduced for faceless assessment. 135A has also been made very pivotal in this pro amendment of 2022. It has been introduced, if you observe in Section 148A, as a source of information for purpose of initiating reassessment proceedings. It has been a big leap for the information under 133 to be considered as a reason for issuing notice under 148. Further reference to valuation officer has been made faceless to section 142B. Assessment of income of escaping assessment, here section 151A has been introduced. And at a later day, we will also see that even the reasons, recording of reasons, the sanction of the superior authority of the CIT or the principal CIT shall be all done in a faceless manner. Rectification of order and demand notice has been made faceless to 157A. TDS TCS has been covered under 231. Revision of orders under section 264A. Giving effect to the orders, the assessing officer presently gives effect to any order. Say the CIT appeals allows a particular issue in your favor. After that, the officer is required to amend his earlier assessment order to, and bring the directions of the judicial authority in his order. So if he has made an addition of say 25 lakh rupees and the CIT appeal deletes 15 lakh rupees, he has to give effect to it and pass an order for balance 10 lakh rupees. This jurisdiction was exclusive with the assessing officer. Which has been, which at a further date will be seen to be made faceless. Anyway, there is no hearing involved in such cases. Prosecution is also expected to be faceless at some time, and approval and registration of the trusts, I believe, shall be faceless. One fascinating thing is every year we observe section 10. And 11, 1023C and 11, which belong to the trust, has always been the favorite section of the finance minister. And it has seen number of amendments each of year. Okay. We'll go summarily go through section 144B. Subsection 1 talks about procedures for purpose of carrying out assessment under 143, 144, and 147. Subsection 2 determines the assessment or class of assessments that are to be carried out in the faceless assessment. Subsection 3 states that certain search centers and units will be established by the board, which are verification unit, TU, BU, and their jurisdiction shall be determined. Subsection 4 determines the constitution of each of such units. Subsection 5 speaks about communication. This is the important section because it talks about how the communication between the assessee and officer will go and also how the notices will be delivered because in the present regime if you observe a big issue has been number of times notices have not been delivered to the SSC and orders have been completed ex party. Subsection 6 speaks about internal communications. Subsection 7 speaks about delivery of notice. Subsection 8 speaks about jurisdiction of the SSC officer in exceptional cases where the baseless assessment shall be transferred to a jurisdiction officer and be carried out in a physical manner. However, what a physical manner is will refer to later as per the notification received by civility. Subsection 9 speaks about how the, what rather it was a very pivotal section. It stated that if the assessment unit fails to follow the procedure of faceless assessment under section 144B, the order thereon shall be considered to be non est Now, if we refer through the recent decisions in writ appeals, say Golden Tobacco by Bombay High Court or Trent Sutra by Bombay High Court, subsection 9 has been referred in detail. They have made a prominent reference to this section stating that since the officer has not followed particular procedure under 144B, the complete order is to be considered non est and then set aside the orders. Now the interpretation of the part whether set aside means the order is completely quashed or the assessing officer may carry out assessment de novo is a different part of it. However, subsection 9 has been strongly relied upon. 
to avoid such complexities in future the department literally omitted subsection 9 is this provision right from 1st april 21 so the finance act 2022 proposes to omit subsection 9 from the face of the act and explanations determine the definitions the structure of the faceless assessment scheme we'll refer to each unit shortly the national faceless assessment scheme shall be a centralized person through which all the communication between the assessee and the department will be streamed assessment units shall be nothing but what function the assessing officer used to do they will broadly identify the points on which the assessment is to be done the income or loss to be determined and the tax payable refund of the assessee be determined accordingly verification units shall carry out a specialized function of verification in form of enquiry cross examination examination of books of accounts examination of witnesses and recording of statements minded recording of statements or examination of witnesses may not be done in a faceless manner it might need a personal hearing and the same has been covered later in subsection 7 they have established a technical unit the technical unit shall provide assistance to the assessment unit wherever the assessment unit is not able to determine certain point due to the intricacies like the advice on legal part of it or the accounting advice information technology or any other technical matter under the act and wide amendment finance act 2022 the technical unit has been made eligible to make an also give assistance in respect of agreement under section 90 and 98 there were the relief of taxes paid in foreign countries and the determination of that relief may also be referred to a technical unit now if we observe technical unit also technical unit shall also carry out valuation of properties which has been a major issue in number of assessments then we come to a review unit the review unit will review the income determination proposal now in 144b we have a completely new concept earlier we had a draft assessment order a lot of litigation surrounded this particular term i'll come to it later and it has been replaced by income determination proposal the review unit has a function of reviewing it checking whether relevant material has been considered where points of facts and law have been incorporated and additional disallowance has been considered properly earlier the review unit also used to consider the judicial decisions that portion has been removed from the particular definition of review unit so we don't know if the review unit will be considering juris jurisprudence or the legal part in assessment order this is a pictorial diagram of how the assessment in faceless manner will be carried out now we are going through the complete procedure under section 144b step by step in detail firstly the assessment reassessment or recomputation under 143 144 or 147 shall be made in a faceless manner so 147 has been covered in the habit the nfsc shall allocate a case to a specific assessment unit and intimate the assessor that his case is being carried out under the faceless regime now issue of notices this will proceed there was a lot of questioning and everybody wondered how the faceless unit or the nfsc is able to issue notice under 1432 or 1421 if we read section 1432 it states that a notice under 1 under the said section may be issued by the assessing officer or a prescribed authority now in order to make the nfsc eligible for issuing such notice by notification dated 31st march 21 the uh, the board specifically authorized the assistant commissioner and the deputy commissioner of nfsc delhi to issue a notice under section 1432 
So the authorized parties to issue 143-2 in NF, the faceless assessment scheme, is the assistant commissioner or the deputy commissioner of NFSC Delhi. As for 142-1, the language of 142 read that the notice under that section could be issued by the assisting officer. There was no mention of prescribed authority. Therefore, amendment was made to such section from 1st April 2021 and a proviso has been inserted, whereby it is stated that a notice under this subsection may also be served by prescribed income tax authority. Sorry. In the first regime of the fiscal assessment, number of times the SSE has called the EU has called for all and every information from the SSE. He has put every standard question that he can put to the SSE without considering the fact that majority of record is in his favor, is in within his position. So the CBDT issued a notification to the officers, which is seldom not referred or not considered by the assessing officer before issuing 142 one notice. However, in legal scenario, we should be aware of this notification while arguing the matter before the authorities, stating that how the assessing officer has not applied his mind or the assessment unit has not applied his mind at all while issuing a question. Because there have been direct, there are directions to the assessment unit to consider all the internal database of department in 360 degree profiling before issuing a notice. So they have to consider what all information is already available with them. Later, the questioner has to be focused on issues to be verified in a limited scrutiny or a scrutiny under section 148 where reasons are recorded. They cannot carry out roving inquiries and they have to stick to the issues involved. Further, for complete scrutiny also, the notification specifically states that Call for information arising from return of income or information on record. Don't carry out roving inquiries asking anything and everything about the amounts that appear for them. For example, the documents such as the income tax return, tax audit report are already available in the income tax database and this should not be called for. Whereas if you refer to any questioner, the first three, four questions pertain to the ITR, the tax audit report and so and so and so, which already is available. Even if we have observed number of penalty notices were received recently, the standard case where an appeal has been filed against the assessment order, we state that kindly the penalty proceedings be kept in abeyance under section 275 as the assessment is an appeal. Such responses have always received a reply from the department that please provide a copy of form number 35 for which the appeal has been filed. Now, form number 35 is within the records of the department. Rather, on the very face of the website, you just go to file forms and you see a form number 35 that for that particular year, file. Yet, they insist on calling on that particular information from the assessee, which shows absolute bureaucracy on part of the department and lethargy in their actions. Sorry, the screen is visible. Screen is not visible, sir. Screen is not visible. Yeah, something happened. I get some other screen appeared. Yeah, now it is visible. It's visible, right? And finally, number of cases that we have observed is a notice under 148 has been issued in case of assessi where the assessi is dead or a merger has been made, the company is merged or amalgamated or has been dissolved. In such cases, there are a number of decisions, including decision of Bombay High Court, which states that 
an assessment in name of a person that does not exist is invalid. Madras High Court went to an extent stating that it is not responsibility of the assessee to, to intimate the death of a person and cancel the pan in time. In order to avoid such cases, the department is also, civility rather, has also considered one more particular instruction stating that in the questionnaire, ask the assessee if the SSC continues to exist in same form and identity. But I have not seen this query anywhere in a questionnaire. And that would be nice of the department to ask about health. Moving on ahead, so the NFSC shall issue a notice under 143.2 or 142.1. And there is no extension to file a reply to this notice. 142.1 has now been introduced to Finance Act 2022 or the Finance Bill 2022, sorry. It was not available earlier. This has been made, introduced according to the proviso that has been introduced in 142.1 as we discussed. Now, where a case is assigned to assessment unit, it may call for further evidences from the SSE or particular verification of the verification unit or the technical unit. <coughs> sorry. The NFSC shall forward such in case where further information is called, they will issue appropriate notice to the SSC calling for further information. In case of verification, the matter will be referred to the verification unit and for technical assistance to the technical unit through automatic automated allocation system. So it is not at the discretion of any officer sitting in the NFSC to determine, but it will be all through a system and technology that will automatically allot the particular verification and technical assistance to a respective unit for the report. The NFSC shall receive the report from the verification unit or technical unit. Consider it it's that the procedure in which the verification or technical unit will operate has not been mentioned. It is left to wonder as to if verification unit will call for any further information for the SSC or the technical unit might call for further information. However, no process of issuing a notice in that case or filing a reply to a particular verification unit or technical unit has been provided in the procedure right now. And this should be considered somewhere in the post budget recommendations for the Finance Act. Moving ahead. The NFSC will simply forward the report received from the DU and TU to the assessment unit. In case where the SSC fails to comply with the notice under section 142.1 or 143.2, NFSC shall intimate the same to the AU. The AU will issue a show cause notice under section 144 asking why best judgment assessment will not be fine. Now, in a regular course of assessment where the SSC does not file a response, we used to receive this particular notice under section 144. Why a best judgment assessment will not call for? To which, if we reply, the assessing officer would consider reply. If not, he would pass an ex parte order. However, in a faceless assessment, you get another opportunity and we'll come to it now. Further, the assessee file either file his response within time or may not file response to the show cause notice for best judgment. The EU shall, after considering the reply of the SSC file or the intimation that the SSC is not responding at all, prepare an income or loss determination proposal. Under the old act, the assessment unit used to pass a draft assessment order. Now the term has been changed to income or loss determination proposal. Why so? In number of red petitions that challenging the faceless assessment before the high courts, the high court stated that the assessee was to be given an opportunity where a variation a variation proposal a prejudicial to the interest of the SSC was proposed. The department stated that we have issued a show cause notice asking that why we should not do so and so additions. However, the particular show cause notice did not mention as to what all additions are to be considered point by point and what is the quantum of the additions. Here the high court state that the procedure refers to a draft assessment order and issue of a show cause notice. Therefore, the show cause notice should be in form of a draft assessment order, just like an assessment order. And where no such order has been provided to the SSE for filing his reply, 
it would be considered as considered as procedure under 144 b has not been followed now in order to avoid all this litigation they simply changed the word draft assessment order and made it income or loss determination proposal now in this particular income or loss determination proposal we will refer to as ildp if it is not prejudicial to the sse the same shall be sent to nfs if it is prejudicial to the sss show cause notice will be issued to the sss calling for his response on it see in regular assessment 144 was issued a best judgment notice show cause notice was issued you did not file a reply and ex parte order was passed but in faceless regime you get another opportunity because obviously assessment unit in majority cases is going to make some variation if they do not make any very variation i'm more than happy if they are making a variation, they are bound to issue another show cause notice. So this is the second opportunity. However, this is a double edged sword as well. Because tomorrow, if you do not file a response to this show cause notice either, and you file an appeal, it would be the appellate authority is obviously going to question is you are given two specific opportunities in respect to the additions proposed by the AO. However, you did not respond to a single show cause notice and why the appeal should be entertained before the judicial authorities either going ahead the assessee in response to the show cause notice will either file a response or may fail to file a response again the assessment you the au shall consider the response filed by the ssc or where no response is filed prepare an income or loss proposal and send send same to the rfs The NFSC shall, on receipt of the particular INDP, convey to the AU to prepare a draft assessment order. So now a draft assessment order is passed for the first time. Or it may refer it to a review unit. Where a review uh, reference to review unit is made, the review unit will file a report. The review report will be again forwarded to the assessment unit. The assessment unit may either accept or reject some or all of the modification after recording its reason. Now, this is completely new. Earlier, the assessment it was stated that assessment units shall consider the modifications. So there was an implication that the AO is bound by the modification suggested by the review unit. However, now the provision specifically states that the AU is at liberty to either accept or reject, but when he rejects, he has to record reasons, which is quite reasonable. The AU shall finally pass a draft assessment order where a review is made. Now the draft assessment order shall be forwarded to NFSC. Here we may note in the earlier processes, where the review unit proposed any modifications, if those modifications were considered by the assessment unit and a revised draft order was passed, the same draft order was subject to giving an opportunity to the assessee again. However, that particular portion has been removed from the new law. So the modifications proposed by review unit are not provided to the assessee in order to file their say. They would act like a final say of the department where accepted by the AU. The NFSC in case of eligible SSC, eligible SSC means a case where transfer pricing issue is involved. They will serve the draft assessment order on the SSC. See, draft assessment order is served only in a case where there's a transfer pricing issue. In the old uh, regime, the draft assessment order was passed by the AO, even in regular uh, assessment proceedings, AU and were forwarded to the SSC for their remark. However, in the re new regime, draft order is only given in a transfer pricing assessment. If the NTP issue is not involved, then the final assessment order is passed. In case of a TP issue, the SSC will file is acceptance or file an objection with the DRP as well as the NFSC. The NFSC is also to be uh, intimated with objections. The NFSC forwards such objections to the AU unit 
in case where no objection is received or acceptance is received from the SSC, the AU unit directs the AU, sorry, the NFSC directs the AU to pass a assessment order as per the draft order. In case where objection is filed, the NFSC receives the report from the DRP and the same DRP order is given to the AU in order to pass an assessment order in accordance with the directions of the DRP. Once the assessment order is finalized, the NFSC shall serve a copy of the order and notice for initiating the penalty proceedings to the SSC along with the demand notice. All the electronic records of the SSC shall be transferred to the jurisdictional officer here from after the completion of assessment. Finally, a new proviso has been introduced, which says, proviso number 22, if any stage, at any stage of proceedings before the EU is of the opinion that a specific audit, a special audit under 142A is necessary, it may upon recording its reason in writing, refer the case to NFSC in order to deal with same in accordance with provisions of subsection 7. Earlier special audit was not given a, a, a specific provision for special audit was not made in the faceless assessment uh, procedures. Now the EU after recording its reason may simply refer the issue to the NFSC. If you read through section 142 2A as it exists in the act today and the evolution of law considering the decision of honorable apex court in sahara india it was made mandatory that before a special audit is ordered an opportunity of being heard is to be given to the ssc without such opportunity the special audit direction shall be bad in law however in the new regime we see no opportunity to be given to the ssc before considering a issue for special audit here simply the satisfaction of the assessment unit that the data provided for them is voluminous or there are complexities involved in the particular accounts of the SSE and referring reason to that effect the EU may simply order a special order, uh, refer a special order to the NFSC but no opportunity for the same is granted to the SSE to retaliate so if you see and read through the procedure of 144b we need to admit that it has been simplified to great extent now the earlier procedure used to be quite complicated in a form to read the procedure itself it used to take used to take hours and to understand it days for the department to follow the complete procedure within the provided time limit was impossible Therefore, we received the orders where the replies of SSC were not considered or the SSC was given hardly three days of time during the course of assessment proceedings and so on. Considering all this scenario, they had to simplify the process. What has been removed from the old process is firstly, the opportunity to the SSC after a review unit gives its modifications. The review is made only once. The draft assessment order is not provided to the SSC and what is provided is the income and loss determination proposal that to once, whereas in the earlier assessment, until the variations are proposed by the assessment unit and review unit, the cycle used to go on by providing an opportunity to the SSC, leading to a never ending process. Now the procedure is much more structured and simplified and I believe the assessment proceedings will be carried out in a more synchronized manner here from. The question that lands for us is then what is the jurisdictional officer going to do if the faceless assessments are being carried out by NFSC? What is the jurisdictional officer left with? See, though the assessment has been brought within the ambit of faceless assessment, that is, the assessment under 147 is covered in faceless assessment, yet the NFSC is not empowered to issue notice under section 148 or to carry out inquiry under 148A. So even today, the jurisdictional officer will carry out inquiry under 148A. Then he will issue a notice under 148. 
and therefrom the proceedings shall be converted into faceless assessment further the assessment excluded from the ambit of faceless assessment shall be carried out by the jurisdictional officer rectification of mistakes is yet in the jurisdiction of the jurisdictional ao special audit when we refer to subsection 7 we will see that special audit after considering the recommendation of the assessment unit will be transferred to the jurisdiction officer so special audit will be added responsibility the jurisdiction officer will be giving effect to the appellate orders given today the act has not been amended to make it baseless proposal seeking sanction for launch of prosecution will also be carried out by the officer jurisdiction officer and recovery of demand you don't have to be apprised of it we are suffering it today number of calls from the department for recovery of taxes so we feel or on reading through the orders that are to be covered by the jao it seems that that will be carried out in a physical manner as it, it used to be in the old times however a specific procedure has been dictated by cbdt to be followed by the jurisdictional officer when carrying out the assessment we'll read through it and understand all processes in cases transferred under 144b subsection 8 of the act may be conducted electronically to extend technically feasible except in those cases where the assessee does not have e filing account email to communicate electronically for cases without digital footprint jurisdictional officer shall endeavor to get the e filing account of assessee registered and then conduct the proceedings therefore even the jurisdictional officer is expected to carry out the proceedings in a faceless manner through the e filing account and the registered email id directions are also issued that when a assessee does not have a e filing account he may be assisted and uh, e filing account be registered and the proceedings therefrom be conducted in a electronic manner the request for personal hearing shall generally be allowed to the assessee with approval of range head mainly after assessee has filed written submission to show cause notice personal hearing may be allowed to assessee preferably through video conference if video conference is not technically feasible personal hearing may be conducted in the designated area in income tax offices so if at all the first clause cannot be followed as in the assessment cannot be carried out through the e filing account or through the email in that case a personal hearing may be granted but that too won't be in the office of the assessing officer but a designated area in the income tax office and the hearings may be recorded as well so nothing has been left to a physical hearing everything has been converted into faceless assessment <coughs> section 144b8 this section trans provides power to nfsc rather the principal cit or the principal dgit to transfer a case to the jurisdictional assessing officer with prior approval of the board and this is at the discretion of the nfsc under subsection 2 of section 144b certain assessments have been left out of the ambit of faceless assessment under section 144b these assessments were initially introduced by a notification bringing only two cases that is the assessment order in case of central charge that is the search and survey assessments and secondly assessment assigned to international tax charges subsequently another introduction to this exception was made by the notification on 6 september 2021 whereby assessment orders in cases where pendency could not be created on itba portal because of technical reasons or cases not having a pan as the case may be even these cases were referred to the jurisdictional assessing officer and finally recently just for the ssk matters another notification was issued on 11 september 21 when the assessment order in cases set aside to do de novo assessment to be done under section 147 of the act but the assessment is to be done under section 147 or a de novo assessment as in the case of ssk was referred was ref 
was to be carried out by the jurisdictional assessing officer. However, this was only for the assessments which were time bearing on 30th September 2021. But this clause had a sunrise and a sunset within 19 days. And only three assessments stand out of the scheme of facilities assessment now. That is the search and survey cases, the international taxation cases, and the assessment where pendency cannot be created on the ITBA portal. This was a notification issued on 12 February 21. Where the jurisdictional assessment officers. Were brought to notice that returns of income have been filed and notice under 143 of the act has not been issued. A return of income has not been filed and 142 one of the act have not been issued. Do not fall within ambit of faceless assessment scheme. This notification is important and to be noted because in case of assessment under section 147 where a notice under 143.2 of the act was not issued by JNO because the return was not filed. As on the date of introduction of the scheme or a return of income have not been filed and 142.1 was not issued as on the date of introduction of the scheme of face assessment, that cases were to be carried out by the jurisdictional assessing officer only and not by the face assessment. In case it is carried out by a face assessment scheme, we can always challenge such orders on their validity. We'll just move ahead and not go through the flow chart. Communication. How is the communication to be made? The communication between the assessment unit, RU, BU, TU, or the SSC will be through electronic modes only, ex except in case of inquiry or verification to be carried out by a verification unit. That might not be in electronic mode because verification like books of accounts or verification, a physical verification of premises or assets would be required in such cases. Authentication. If we refer to all the facial assessment orders till date, those are signed by the NFAC pending. Number of read petitions, as we are aware, have been filed. In these cases, NFAC has been, been made a party. NF, the CBT also issued a notification in this respect, stating, heading it or titling it as read petition procedures, where they state that. The particular appeal filed against a faceless assessment shall be considered by the principal CIT or CCIT of a particular RFSC or the regional faceless assessments center. And only in case where the policy or the procedure of faceless assessment is challenged, the NFSC may be bothered. So NFSC has just pushed out his responsibility and transferred it to the units in the particular jurisdiction. Therefore, now the NFSC or sorry, the assessment orders will not be signed by the NFSC. They have detached themselves from it and authentication of NFSC will be electronic communication itself. The moment you receive an email from the NFSC or an upload on your web portal, it will be considered as it has been authenticated by NFSC. Who will sign the orders then? The order shall be signed by the AU, VU, TU, or RU. That is either the assessment unit, the verification unit, the technical unit, and the review unit will sign their particular or respective orders with digital signatures. In respect of SSC, another liberty has been given. Earlier, the submission could be verified only with the digital signature of PVC and due to which number of submissions could not be filed in time. Now they have liberalized it and even a submission filed by logging into a registered accounting account of the SSC will be considered as authenticated by the SSC. Delivery of notice. A delivery of notice will be made by placing an authenticated copy of the order on the SSC's registered account. That is the income tax portal or registered email address or the assistant's mobile app and followed by real time. So sending this particular order on the registered on the income tax portal, email ID or the mobile app, the department also has to send a real time alert to the SSC. And then it would be considered as a valid delivery of order in my opinion. 
the reply of the assessee shall be considered to be filed when the acknowledgement receipt in the hash result is generated however in number of cases when the new website was being implemented we observed that the hash result was not created or uh, the hash result was not generated or the submission of response acknowledgement was not generated sorry just a minute hello yes hmm. sorry in the definitions the registered email address is important before we go into it i would advise all the chartered accountants to kindly update the email address of the assessee on the income tax portal because all the communications are received on that email address and if tomorrow a particular communication is not received we can always state that the email address has been updated on the website however the communication is not received it is not feasible i understand for the chartered accountants to log into every income tax portal every time and verify whether notice is received therefore a simple exercise that may update the email addresses of everybody of all the ssc's in time now what they consider as a registered email address is the email address available in electronic filing account that is on the income tax portal or the email address available in last income tax return further the email address on pan or aadhar or the one available in the mca portal shall also be considered as a registered email address however once again kindly update the email addresses on the income tax portal of the ssc and uh, this particular thing attains prominence because it is the responsibility of the ssc to intimate the department that what is the updated address a similar issue came up before the honorable supreme court but the court apex court helps holds that when assc does not specifically intimate his new address to the assessing officer service of notice under 1432 at old address shall be considered to be a valid service though this decision was delivered in the physical era but it will be equally applicable to the electronic service of notice as well certain further definitions i doubt in is very important communication so no appearance no physical appearance is allowed even the personal hearings will be carried out through video conferencing uh, many times the assessor is wondering that yes i'll come to know who is my assessing officer uh, when i ask for a personal hearing and then i can uh, i can reach him somehow uh, it's a faceless assessment so the screen will be blurred you cannot see the face of the assessing officer however he can see your face because he wants to see the expression on your face when you put certain questions to you so expect a physical personal hearing through a view where the eu the assessment unit or the particular officer of the assessment unit will not be visible time and place of dispatch will be as per section 13 of information technology act will not get to into act that period for filing a response see presently we see the uh, number of times a particular window for filing the reply is available even after the due date and we are comfortably filing responses to that particular uh, open notice however as per an instruction issued by cbdt the facility for electronic submission of documents through e proceeding shall be automatically closed 7 days before the time barring date so suppose the assessment is time barring on 31st of march 2022 the e filing shall be closed on 23rd of march itself and 7 days prior to 31st of march so this is just for information there have been cases and uh, there have been cases where the assessee did not receive a electronic communication maybe because uh, he did not give a valid email id or is not active with email IDs. In such cases, there are specific direction to the assessing officer. So if you read the highlighted para, in cases where the notice issued by prescribed income tax authority remains undelivered electronically, 
where email delivery status is bounced, blocked email or sending block. Assessing officers shall take print of these notices generated by prescribed income tax authority available in ITBA and serve them physically in the SSC. In the few cases I have received such notices. Personal hearing. <clears throat> Majority of the challenges to the assessment orders and to the PESLIS era was on the point that no personal hearing has been provided to the SSC in the course of assessment despite a specific request for that. To which number of high courts give us very strict view. And one of such decisions we may refer to Bharat Aluminium, a very recent decision in January 2022, a month before. The, all, the high court wrote this particular para in caps itself, determining the emphasis of this. Use of the expression may in section 144b7 8 is not decisive, where a discretion is conferred upon a quasi judicial authority whose decision has civil consequences. The word may, which denotes discretion, should be construed to mean a command. Consequently, this court is of view that requirement of giving an assessee a reasonable opportunity of hearing is mandatory. The earlier scheme of faceless assessment stated that where a SSC requests for a personal hearing under subsection 7, the specific request shall be considered by the principal CIT CIT of the regional faceless assessment center. And if they consider it appropriate, they may grant a hearing. So it was at the discretion of certain officers of the department. What has been stressed is opportunity of hearing is a right of an SSC. It's principle of natural justice and it has to be provided to us. Number of decisions were passed on this case and we referred to a recent decision. Mm -hmm. Considering this particular scenario, the act has been amended through finance bill 2022 and giving an opportunity has been made mandatory. We'll refer to the first two paras in a case where variation is proposed in the income or loss determination proposal or draft assessment order and an opportunity is provided to us to show cause the SEC may request for a personal hearing to make his oral submission. Income tax authority of relevant unit shall allow such hearing through NFSC, which shall exclusively conduct through video conferencing. Now it has been said that relevant units shall allow such hearing. It has been made mandatory to provide a physical hearing when it is asked for. This is a great relief. And I would suggest that wherever intricacies are involved in the issue or lots of documents to be referred, always ask for a personal hearing, rather in the final submission that you make before the assessing officer, make it a point that the last para states that in case your honor is not satisfied with the particular submission or the, your respected self or the good self is not satisfied with my submission, kindly give me a personal hearing in order to present, represent personally and make my points. Further, this, even if it is a personal hearing, it shall be carried out through a video conferencing. Uh, we may also refer to a decision of Honorable Supreme Court dated 20, May 2021, where the Honorable Supreme Court beautifully worded the importance of physical assessment and physical hearing. This doesn't only talk about a physical hearing, but how a physical appearance in appellate proceedings is important. I'll read through it. The manner in which judicial proceedings are conducted, especially in our superior courts, is unique to each judge and holds great weight in dispensation of justice. The issues raised or comments made by bench during an oral hearing provide clarity, not just to the judges who adjudicate upon the matter, but also allow lawyers to develop their arguments with a sense of creativity founded on spontaneity of thought. Many a times judges play the role of a devil's advocate with counsel to solicit responses which aid in holistic understanding of case and test the strength of the arguments advanced before them. That is where the real art of advocacy comes to play. The order or judgment of court must indicate a process of reflection and of the application of mind of judge to submission of opposing parties. So it is beautifully worded that the, the art of advocacy will develop through physical hearings when on the spot a spontaneous thought develops in the advocate's mind, which in the faceless era has seen a doomsday. 
Now we are referring to subsection 9 of section 144B. Subsection 9 stated that where an assessment order under section 143 3 or 144 was not, followed, was not passed as per the procedure laid out under section 144B, the particular order shall be considered to be non national This was quite a structure. However, it was important as well to know that the internal procedures of the department are carried out properly. As discussed earlier, thrusting on this particular subsection, many high courts have quashed the assessment orders for not providing a draft assessment order to the SEC or not giving him a personal hearing. In order to avoid such cases, the revenue, sorry, the government through finance bill has omitted the section with effect from 1st April 2021. Where it does arise, can the department omit a section with a substantial effect on the SSE retrospectively from 1st April 2021? And we'll have to wait to see how the law evolves here from. Uh, 142.2a, we refer to subclause uh, sub 22 of subsection 1, where assessing office assessment unit feels it necessary that a special audit to be carried out under 142.2a, they may record the reasons and forward it to the NFSC. In the principal CCIT or DGIT of NFSC, if they consider appropriate that provisions of 142.2a may be invoked in a case, they shall forward the reference to PCCIT, CCIT having jurisdiction over the assessment or the assessee and inform to the AU and transfer the case to the assessing officer having jurisdictional over the case in accordance with subsection 8. So even in this procedure, no opportunity of hearing has been given to the assessee and therefore we'll have to see how the validity of a particular reference of special audit be held especially in light of the decision of Honorable Supreme Court in Sahara India. Just to summarize, the amendments of finance bill in section 144b, reassessment has been brought within the ambit of fiscal assessment, no draft assessment order, but a show cause notice to be issued to the SSC where variation is proposed. So we are not expecting an order specifying all the issues and the quantum, but simply a show cause notice. A personal hearing has been mandatory, been made mandatory. Regional faceless assessment center has been abolished. Even earlier, when they introduced RFSC, we did not we wondered what is the function and the importance of RFSC apart from uh, providing a personal hearing. Now RFSC has been removed completely as personal hearing has been made mandatory itself. The assessment unit is empowered for reference to special audit under 142A. Section 144 B subsection 9, that is the section that made order non-est in case the procedure is not followed, has been abolished since 1st April 2021 retrospectively. Consideration of judicial decisions is removed from scope of review unit. Though the same is implied in the language of the act, the AU can reject the modifications proposed by review unit after recording the reasons. So AU is not bound by the review, the modification proposed by review unit. However, if they have to be rejected, they have to record the reason. A new term has been introduced, income or loss determination proposal instead of draft assessment order that was plotted earlier. No opportunity to assess it to file a submission for modification proposed by the review unit. Earlier, even after the review unit proposed a modification and there was variation to the assessment order, an opportunity was granted to the SSC. But now what the review unit states would be final as far as the assessment order is concerned. The SSC can authenticate the submission by simply logging into the designated court. Now we will run through certain issues that are being faced in the faceless assessment scheme. Obviously, these are the issues that I could think of. If we come any uh, further with any other issues, we'll consider those in the questioning session. So firstly, the initial notice under 142 or 142 one is issued by the NFSC. However, no provision for extension of time is provided. 
Now see if the SEC fails to file a response in time, in that particular case, the SEC shall be liable to penalty of 10,000 under section 272A1D, which is quite a uh, substantial consequence. Therefore, the act should be amended to provide a provision for extension of time where requested by the SEC. In the in the physical era, the limited scrutiny. In the limited scrutiny, particular issues were defined. If the assessing officer wanted to travel beyond that issue, there was a procedure provided in notification of 2016, whereby the assessing officer has to record his reasons, follow the quantum that the particular amount exceeds 5 lakhs in, met in metro cities 10 lakhs and other cities 5 lakhs, and he has to record a reason for why he's considering that income has escaped assessment over and above the issues already considered. There was a very strict procedure to be followed, which was to be approved by CIT in order to convert a limited scrutiny to a complete scrutiny. Now, in a faceless era, if a limited scrutiny is taken up or a scrutiny on specified issues is taken up, in order to convert that particular scrutiny into a complete scrutiny, no procedure has been specified. Further, what if notice is delivered on the designated portal, but no real time alert is issued. In my opinion, that would not be a proper delivery because the section states that upload it on the portal and give a real time alert. In the old era, under section 144A, the SEC could made, make application to the joint commissioner for issuing directions to the assessing officer. No such procedure is available in the faceless era and what the assessment unit states would be would have to be followed and be repeated in our submission. The assessment unit that will be allotted to a particular SSC would be out of its jurisdiction. For example, the assessment of a person in Maharashtra will be carried out somewhere in Punjab. Now, a Punjab person won't understand the custom trade practices or jargons in Maharashtra state. Like here we call certain amount paid to the government as Nazrana or the concept of sadhwar. The terms used in Punjab are absolutely different. They won't understand what the SEC is stating. This particular issue needs to be overcome or at least the technical units should provide assistance to the AU in respect of such jargons and customer practices. Further, an issue which arises, which to some extent has also been settled is, what would happen, sorry, which High court would be considered as jurisdictional high court. The place where the SSC resides, or the jurisdiction of SSC exists, or the place where the assessment unit exists. Coming to following certain decisions, especially the decision of PF and ESIC cases, followed by Salzlitter, Hydraulics, Hyderabad ITT, and even Amritsar ITT, which specifically stated that. The jurisdictional high court of the SSC shall be considered as a supreme high court and as the uh, high court which will have authority over the this uh, the case of the SSC. Therefore, for Maharashtra, the decision of Bombay High Court shall be binding even if the assessment unit is placed somewhere in Uttar Pradesh or Kolkata. Further. Will the SSC be allowed access to internal communication between the BU, TU and the assessment unit? In order to understand like many a times it happens as we discussed that the officer determines the value of the property as per ready rectangle rate. What if the assessing officer himself has or the assessment unit has himself considered the valuation and passed an order? When a specific or specialized function has been established in form of a technical unit, the assessment unit should be bound to make reference to the technical unit in such cases and that report has to be obtained in respect to the valuation of particular property and similar issues. If this procedure is not followed, the assessment order cannot be considered to be valid because the assessment unit has, does not have the understanding or the requisite knowledge of the particular issue. In order to know this, it is necessary that we are given access to the internal communications of the department on request. <clears throat> the NFSC may transfer case to jurisdictional assessing officer 
on their discretion and there is no determined criteria for it so there is a possibility of arbitrary exercise of power in this case see the nfsc or comprises of principal ccit and cci in such cases how the revision under section 263 and 264 shall operate especially as the faceless iran 264a has not been introduced as of yet today in rectification proceedings we are filing the rectification application before the jurisdictional officer it is not clear as to whether the jurisdictional officer is to obtain a permission for rectification because in majority of the cases the rectification applications are simply being rejected even in case where the assessment unit has not considered the submission of the assessee which is very much a mistake apparent from the court there is no common portal or id provided for communication of a communication with the department suppose he assessee files a response to a particular notice and tomorrow he wants to file further details which has come to his knowledge however no notice is issued how will the assessee communicate this particular information in a physical era we used to visit the income tax department and provide a particular new decision see sir this is a new decision decision of the jurisdictional high court on the particular issue which covers my case please consider this before filing the order now the assessee has no such option to provide additional data where no notice is issued this particular issue has to be considered and a common portal or some email id needs to be provided that the assessee could reach the assessment unit or the nfsc even in case where no notice is issued the risk management strategy is not been determined yes this is us come to light number of times that the orders have been passed without considering the request for adjournment or without considering the submission filed by the assessor notices have been have been served on wrong email id which has led to failure on for compliances by the assessee and therefore number of assessments have been made ex parte leading to substantial tax demand in the hands of the ss the size limit determined on the income tax portal is 5 mb which is not sufficient for filing a response i believe it's been made 10 mb now however i personally see that in complicated cases we need to file substantial evidences which run over number of pages and the quality of the page also has to be considered maintained because if the assessment unit is not able to read your documents they won't consider it when passing the assessment order at all therefore a good quality of scanning requires good point of storage the easiest way would be just make the filing of documents in csv format that would be easy and the file size should be will be reduced to great extent as we discuss further no opportunity of hearing is given to the ssc before ordering a special audit again omission of subsection 9 to 144 b retrospectively the validity needs to be considered the ssc is not granted opportunity to file a submission <coughs> in respect of modifications proposed by the review unit what the review unit states becomes the final verdict on the assessment order and the assc is not facilitated with filing some submission or is say on that the tax officers also stated certain issues faced by them for example no communication of reason for compulsory selection of scrutiny no facility of translation and this stated what if a particular document is in the language of a particular area say uh, say uh, a particular document a registered deed in maharashtra is in marathi how a officer in up is is expected to understand what is stated so that the technical units should assist the ssc with translation as well because translation is not specifically mentioned within the scope of a technical unit reference to view is written without any report or 
no facility in ITBA to issue summons under section 131, and no clarity in scope of complete scrutiny, whether to restrict to specific issue. These were certain issues faced by the tax officers. Now we will consider certain sorry <clears throat> points for filing of submission before the assessment unit and appearance. See earlier when we appeared in the physical era, we used to have certain face value. We had a rapport with the assessing officer sitting across the table. We could explain better, and any queries of the assessing officer could be resolved right there from. And there was a better understanding to the assessing officer of the issue involved and the explanation of the assessing. In the faceless era, all you have to rely upon is a submission that you file. So the submission has to be very clear, properly worded and bringing out every issue specifically along with the submission of the SSC and the judicial decisions that cover the issue. A clear submission will come from proper understanding of the act. Therefore, reading the act, understanding the sections and using the language of law in your submission is equally important. Certain parameters that we may follow in order to ensure that the submission is well taken by the officer and that we make the job of the assessment units simple and easy are that to every submission, make it a point that we prepare an index mentioning the documents, including the submission. So even file a page number to the submission, because tomorrow, if you are given a personal hearing in the course of personal hearing, you will have to refer to a particular page of your submission, stating that on this page, I have stated this particular uh, content already, or this decision has been referred on this particular page already. So make it a point that the submission is paged properly. An index always makes the job of the officer very easy because he's able to toggle through all the pages and the evidences quite comfortably and feasibly. Prepare a covering letter in the covering letters, state that you have provided an index, attach the document serially and how the numbering pattern is there. So the, before taking up a particular case, the assessing officer is happy to know that this particular submission is made in a proper and a systematic manner. In the submission, refer the notice DIN. So always make a reference to the the document identification number state the facts in brief you need not go very deep into each and every aspect of it make it concise but always make a brief state the facts in brief before you start with your submission make a submission on legal points relying on the judicial jurisprudence in case you have a decision of judicial high court mention that and also rely on the point that state decision is binding on the assessment unit and refer to relevant decisions where uh, like the decision of honorable uh, amrit sir itat where it states that the jurisdictional decisions are equally applicable even in the faceless era rely on precedents give link and reference to same so as much as possible or if you, it is technically feasible for you this is the practice that i follow in my submission i create a link to a particular document Either put all the documents in a single folder and in my covering letter, I also state instructions to the officer that please paste all the documents in a single folder so that the link shall operate and it will be easy for you to refer through my submission. Make a submission on merits. Give link to relevant documents at the correct place. See, even on merits, bring out your points properly in a concise manner usually use pointers don't avoid stating your submission in paragraphs or if you're stating in paragraphs make the paragraph small it is easier to understand and read for the particular authority conclude your submission always go through what all you have stated because 
over read uh, over the time span of reading through the complete submission certain points may be lost whatever important points that you are referring to or you are thrusting upon make a short reference to them in your concluding paragraph also make alternative submissions after making complete submission you may state that without prejudice to the above submission if at all say uh, a case where uh, tds was not made and a disallowance was made under section 40a ia for a year say 1780 later the law was amended and the uh, disallowance has been restricted to 30% only you explain your case maybe you obtain the uh, Form number twenty six A from the chartered accountant of particular authority, or show that you have already paid the TDS so and so and so, or you state that this is not an expense but a reimbursement of expenses, and therefore no TDS is made. And finally, make an alternative submission stating that without prejudice to what I have stated, if you do not agree with my submission, follow the provision of section forty A I A and make a disallowance only to the extent of thirty percent. and not more than that again avoid repetition and bulky submissions keep it as short as possible ask for another opportunity always end your submission with a para that if your good self is not happy with my submission you do not agree with me or is not satisfied with it kindly provide me another opportunity to represent the matter or provide additional evidences as your honor honor six this helps you tomorrow because in case your all the assessment is passed uh, is not passed in your favor you have a ground to say that you had asked for a specific hearing on this point further <clears throat> where there are bulky documents make it a point that you number properly usually use red color for numbering upper right corner highlight the relevant extract of case law see nobody has time to read even your submission the assessing officer never reads so one more uh, advice that i will give you is try to highlight the important points in my uh, ppt today i have highlighted relevant points and i believe nobody has read through anything but the highlighted portion of it same goes with the assessment unit they won't refer through your complete submission highlight the relevant extract if they are interested in it they read the complete para similarly when you refer to the case laws highlight the relevant portion of case laws now if he is concerned he will go and read the facts of the case but at least the deciding part of the case law has to be highlighted make it a point that you also reproduce the relevant extract of the case law in your submission as well because officer is not going to take the effort to go and refer through a decision on himself if you refer to a particular para he might take a call and refer to a particular decision for responses uh, make sure that you file a response in time in case you are not ready with the matter file a adjournment immediately this helps avoiding penalty and shows that you are interested in complying there is not so lapse on your part in case the window is closed but certain documents are to be provided send a email on this particular email id right now if any other email id comes up will the same may be used documentation in documentation bring all the factual documents on record avoid additional evidences later so in the course of assessment proceeding itself make it a point that you bring all the records that are on uh, or all the documents and evidences on record however do consider that certain document that is adverse to yourself may not be brought on record because in appellate proceedings when a particular document is be produced it becomes a difficulty to have it accepted as a additional evidence especially because even the face uh, appeals before the cit appeals are made faceless in that case it becomes a point that the we also have to go to itt request the itt that additional documents be accepted and then the matter is again set aside to the cit appeals this increases the cost and the effort involved in the complete appellate proceedings therefore avoid this unrequired exercise and bring all the evidences on record file submission on all the grounds comprehensively do not rely on dozens of judgments only consider cases which cover your issue and are applicable to the facts 
always prefer decision of the jurisdictional high court and jurisdictional IT AP. Jargons. In your submission, most of the times, the issue that it challenges is the agricultural income and usually refer to 712 extract and state that, see, this, this is my land and uh, it's in my name. I own so much of land. This is the crop. Officer of placement unit might not understand the importance of a 712 extract. What is a 712 extract? Therefore, it is always advisable to give a small description of jar jargons like the 712 extract state that it is a document in Maharashtra strictly followed for agricultural purposes, which determine the title of a property and also determine the crops taken on this. Also, refer to certain decisions of uh, decisions where 712 extract has been considered as a valid document or valid proof of agricultural income. <clears throat> Translation, uh, make it a point that no document in Marathi is submitted, always translate it. If not from my advocate, at least translate it yourself and state it as a free English translation. If required, the officer may call for a certified translation from my advocate. However, make it a point that you file a translation yourself at least. In scanning, make it, this document should be scanned in proper resolution. There should be an order. Many times it happens that we scan on the both side, the other side is blank and there are a number of blank spaces that appear on the page, which becomes a difficulty in reading and increases the size of the document for no good reason. Prefer scanning the original documents over the Xeroxes. See to it that the documents that you enclose along with submission are not password projected. Especially when you file appeal against the late fee under section 234E, we attach the intimation under section 200A or under rectification order under 154 right with 200A. These particular files are password protected. So you attaching a particular file is of going to be of no use to the assessment unit. Make it a point that you remove passwords. Most importantly, please update the registered mobile number and email ID on income tax because you are going to receive a real time alert by SMS or on your registered mobile number. So please take the exercise and register all the email IDs properly on the income tax website. When filing the return of income or even while filing the submission, take care that 360 degree profiling is taken into consideration. The AIS data is referred to. You have an idea of what the income tax department already has and accordingly make your submission. Common issues faced by all of us in the course of the faceless assessment in this era for the first cycle in 2021 was that the period for filing a submission was provided less than three days number of times. In such case, file an adjournment or ask for time immediately. Can a time be uh, asked for filing reply to draft order or to the income or loss determination proposal? Yes, do that. If you do not, you are not prepared with your submission. No opportunity proposed for adverse uh, assessment order. In case raise a additional ground, uh, raise a legal ground before the CIT appeal for file it. Both the options are open. Order signed even before due date for filing of submission. In such case, the Honorable High Court has set aside the order to file of assistant officer. Submission has been filed but not considered by the AO. File the rectification before the jurisdictional officer immediately and uh, also consider filing an appeal because the assistant officer is not going to allow a rectification. Some solutions that the department should consider are abide the Abide by directions and provide 15 days of time. Allow uploading of documents in XML or CSV formats, which are small in size. Some other model of submission like an email ID be provided, where the SSC can, can provide additional documents over and above the documents submitted in response to the notice. Let matters with verification of physical records be allowed by jurisdiction officer, like the cases where number of documents are to be referred or even I would suggest the cases which have been set aside by judicial authorities 
to the file of the assessing officer. These cases have already been considered and gone through a complete scrutiny up to the level of IT. Now, when they are being set aside to the officer, it makes or they deserve that they be verified in a physical manner and the SCC be heard physically. Classify matters into manual and faceless scheme and the manual would obviously include the set aside orders as well. What all has been made faceless? See, it started all with filing of income tax return, e-filing of income tax return, then the assessment through a notification, which took form of an ordinance, then which was introduced as a part of the Income Tax Act. The faceless appeals were introduced. Now we are looking forward to all other procedures, which will be made faceless. And as we read through earlier, number of sections have been introduced in the Income Tax Act, like to make rectification application faceless, revision proceedings faceless, so on and so forth. Even the present finance bill has already made the determination of arm's length price under 92 CA faceless, as well as a dispute resolution panel procedure under section 144 C has been made faceless. Over the time, we will see complete proceedings under the income tax will be faceless and very minor procedures and proceedings will be left with the judicial assessing officer. Obviously, recovery proceedings will stay with them. The CBDT through a recent circular pointed out certain issues faced during the first faceless assessment era and has issued a notification to the officers to avoid this. Just to brief those, the assessment order has been passed even before due date. Order is passed without giving a draft assessment order. Opportunity of hearing has been not been given despite a specific request by the SEC. SSC is not allowed enough time to respond. Order is passed without considering submission filed by the SSC. The order is passed on an issue out of the scope of the scrutiny. Order is passed without considering or waiting for the directions of the DRP. Thank you. I'll end my seven lecture here. There are four minutes to seven. I hope. The topic is covered elaborately and everybody understood. Yes, sir. The uh, seminar was in detail. Uh, I hope no participants have questions. So, may I request Salunke, sir, uh, to give a vote of thanks for this wonderful session? You know, sir. Uh, madam, uh, kindly give opportunity to the listeners. Uh, who are attending the program to ask the questions because yeah. I am having certain questions. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. You may proceed before, with the question. Before proceeding further, sure. uh, as, as that jurisdictional high court point is concerned, you have clearly stated that the uh, jurisdiction of the RCC, that jurisdictional high court will prevail. Yes, and sir. those judgments are applicable uh, to that RCC. Yes. But uh, as far as the matter of section 80p is concerned, in case of cooperatives, you must have noticed that uh, when that uh, the SEC is situated at one area and for two different SEC, uh, two different orders is passed. Some of the AOs have allowed the ATP and some of the AOs have not considered the fact that uh, the judgment is in favor of cooperative society. Second, point which I want to uh, make over here is that as far as the rectification under section 154 is concerned, uh, you may got some of the solution from the assessing officer that they state that the rectification uh, has been, order has been passed and uh, no effect in that regard has been made to the computation of income and the demand is still showing as an payable on income tax portal. So what remedies we can uh, have in this regard as far as section 154 and outstanding demand is concerned. Then uh, please note down because I have two more queries. Uh, as far as that appellate uh, 
CIT appeals uh, hearings are concerned. Uh, I have not come across any uh, instance that I, uh, I have received the notice from CIT appeals and whether that is operational, that faceless CIT appeals is still not operational. And many of the times we have given a reply to the penalty notices and still they are issuing the uh, show cause notice for uh, issue, uh, passing the penalty order. So kindly address this issue before proceeding further. So as far as the first issue is concerned, ATP, see the uh, the law settled before ITAT was, I believe you are referring to the uh, business of providing credit facilities to the members in which interest income was earned from banks other from uh, persons other than a cooperative society, right? So that issue was settled up till 2016. Later, the Karnatic High Court came with a decision but they disallowed the particular issue. Following that decision, even the ITT Pune is differing from its earlier opinion and holding that said interest income is not eligible for ATP deduction. So the particular issue is not settled as of yet. So no, if we go to a Karnatak jurisdiction, yes, it is settled in the favor of the revenue and they will follow strictly those decisions. However, coming to Pune we do, uh, or Maharashtra as such, we don't have a specific order of Honorable Bombay High Court. That is the jurisdictional High Court in favor of the SAC. What we have is decision of jurisdictional ITATs. Admittedly, ITAT Pune and ITAT Mumbai have certain orders in favor. But recently, if you see, they are deflecting from those decisions as well, relying on the decision of Karnataka High Court. Second question about 154. Hello. Yes. Second question about the 154 application. Uh, I would like to ask, yes, sir, has the assessing officer provided any relief to you in the 154 order? Uh, uh, no, the facts of the case is that uh, they have not made any kind of an addition uh, mm -hmm. in the assessment order. They have okay. accepted the return income. But while doing the computation, they have not given the credit or uh, made addition while uh, making the computation and raise the demand which is shown in that uh, outstanding demand portal. Sir, this should so be. So I have not uh, uh, made an application for rectification of order, but the rectification of computation. Sir, this that that would be the same thing because the computation ITNS 50 is part of the assessment order itself. So that yes. would amount to rectification of order as such. Uh, I don't understand why because in one of my case, uh, I, the same issue occurred. The assessed income was 10 lakh. In competition, they took it to be 40 lakhs and computed tax on that particular round. We filed a rectification, the competition is revised and then we came back to actual tax liability. So maybe the assessing officer uh, might have not given a effect online because they also are supposed procedurally to file that particular uh, rectified report on ITBA to which they receive a uh, approval from CPC Bangalore. And then the effect is given to the computation as such. So maybe that procedure is pending. You might inquire with the assessing officer. Okay. Uh, thirdly, about the CIT appeals, you state that is it operational or no? Uh, in recent past, I have been receiving notices from CIT appeals for over past three, four months. Mm, also in some, uh, though no order has been received on any of this issue. Yes, they are issuing the very same notice again and again. We are filing a reply, yet no additional documentation or additional submission is called for. They simply fix a date of hearing and call for a submission. That's it. To which we are filing a reply attaching the earlier submission as well, the acknowledgement of earlier submission and stating that this particular reply has been given, kindly give a decision on this or if any additional information is required, please state that. So as of the operational part of it, the decision part of the CIT appeals, I don't see any activity there. However, the notices are received time to time. And finally about penalty, about penalty, I would like to ask, uh, what is the exact issue? Are you making an application to keep the penalty in abeyance or you're giving a reply on merit? Oh, no, we have filed an appeal in certain cases and we have asked to keep the penalty proceedings still in abeyance till the date of decision of that appellate authority. In case of abeyance, uh, what my experience has been, 
until and unless we don't file form number 35 along with the abeyance application they keep issuing a notice they need a copy of form number 35 along with it for merits it's just like assessment proceeding unless and until they don't take a decision on it they will keep issuing notice if any additional information is called for in a particular notice make it a point that you file a reply on that issue okay chairman sir yes sir okay question asal de with baki members ch if any member is having any question can ask Minister, proceed with order of thanks. Good evening, all the participants, uh, uh, speaker, uh, CEO Pratik sir. Uh, thank you for your valuable guidance and thank you for providing the detailed uh, history and the transformation stages over a period of time which we are working. That from uh, right from the physical assessment to faceless assessment. Uh, and uh, uh, i thank all the participants uh, who have uh, participated in this program i assure on behalf of latur brands that we are going to conduct more sessions on this and hopefully we would be conducting the physical session of pratik sir at latur branch uh, thank you for spending your precious time and giving us valuable guidance thank you everyone thank you very much sir. thank you so much it was nice speaking before atul branch again uh, thank you vishal sir and vinod sir as well thank you very much vishal sir don't mute tower yes yes do you want to say something no oh. sir kya bol any doubt clarification एक्सपर्ट इज विथ अस प्रतीक सर को डायरेक्ट ही मिलेंगे अपन यस सर क्या करेंगे अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट दैट एज फार एज दैट लातूर ब्रांच मेंबर्स आर कंसर्न यू ऑल नो प्रतीक सर वी वुड बी वेरी डिलाइटेड टू लेट यू नो दैट लातूर ब्रांच हैज बीन अवार्डेड द फर्स्ट प्राइज इन माइक्रो कैटेगरी इन डब्ल्यूआरसी फॉर दिस आवर करंट ईयर थैंक्स सो बेस्ट ब्रांच इन माइक्रो कैटेगरी so uh, we have uh, organized an, a get together of members at carnival resource we are sending the messages through whatsapp to all of you i request all of you to participate in program uh, and uh, we'll have a celebration for the first time in the last 11 years this is for the first time that latur bash got any award and that also first prize congratulations sir thank you thank you sir